Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just in the interest of making sure that we uh, uh, have as much time with our guests as possible. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy Barnard. I'm the uh, alumni director and a very proud Bandle myself. It's wonderful to have all of you here with us today for Cup of Joe. I'm really glad you could join us. Um, we want to give a special shout out to a few of our guests. Um, former U of I interim president, dean of the law school and professor emeritus Don Burnett is with us today as is former Dean of Students, Bruce Pittman. One of my predecessors, Dick Johnston is on the line. Welcome, Dick, I'm glad you're here. And Vice President for Advancement, uh, Mary Kay McFadden uh, is joining us today. Um, uh, I think Kenton Bird, Jam Professor Kenton Bird is online. Um, it's hard to tell in this Brady Bunch sort of uh, view that I've got here, but um, I'm hoping he uh, is uh, joining us. Anyway, thank you and welcome all. I also want to thank our program sponsor, Payne West Insurance. Payne West is the leading broker in the Pacific Northwest where vandals can shop for home insurance, auto insurance, and more. And every new policy purchased supports the University of Idaho Alumni Association. They're a great partner for us. And thanks to Payne West, everyone on today's call is automatically entered into a drawing for a $25 Vandal Store gift card, which is awesome. Now you have to be present to win, so stay until the end of the call if you can, and we'll announce our winner there. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of reminders. Uh, one, remember to keep your mute button on. Um, just in the interest of all of, our, uh, all of us, keep your mute button on. Um, and if you have questions for today's guests, please um, forward them to Christy Overfelt. Christy, raise your hand, my coworker in the alumni office in the chat, and she'll make sure that we cover as many of your questions as we possibly can in the time we have. Um, now to the important part of the program, right? It's now my pleasure to welcome Don Shelton, the great vandal. Don graduated from what was then the U of I School of Communications, which is now the School of Jur uh, Journalism and Mass Media in 1976, and has been a journalist for 43 years. He looks like he must have started when he was 12. So that's the only thing I can, <laughs> I can uh, think of uh, that happened. 32 of those 43 years were at the Seattle Times and he retired in 2019 as the executive editor of the Seattle Times a position he'd held since 2016. Prior to being the executive editor, he served as a sports editor. Hey, and under, under his leadership, the, the Times earned its first Associated Press Sports Editor, APSI is the uh, acronym, uh, contest Grand Slam, um, which is a big deal. It's when you achieve four top 10 awards in the daily, Sunday, and special sections in its circulation and website uh, categories, a great accomplishment. He also worked at the Yakima Herald Republic, the Bellevue Journal American, the Santa Rosa Press Democrat, and is on the advisory boards for the uh, journalism and mass media school here at U of I, and the Phi Gamma Delta, or as we like to call them, the PG fraternity at Idaho. He also currently serves as an adjunct professor at the University of Idaho. Welcome, Don, we're so glad to have you. Thank you, Kathy, for inviting me. This is uh, really, a, I've been really looking forward to this ever since you asked me. And I, I, I also realized that you're probably scraping the bottom of the barrel to ask me, but I did look at a couple of the other ones and I shouldn't have because it was pretty intimidating. You had a rocket scientist on and I'm, I'm looking at that and thinking, oh boy, this guy's got twice the brains I do and better looking and younger too. So I'm not sure how that all worked out, but I, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm really looking forward to the questions everybody asks. Yeah, but could he really write a good lead? Probably not. So <laughs> welcome. I want to start with a quick uh, COVID check-in. I hope you and yours have been okay through the pandemic. Oh, yeah, we're, we're great. I mean, got my first COVID shot um, and just kind of stashed away here in, uh, in the Seattle area. And the only time I come out of my borough is when I go to Moscow to teach class. So it's been good so far. Thanks for asking. And are you teaching virtually, Don, or are you uh, in person for your classes? Both. Uh, I could have done it virtually, but I decided to, to, to go to the first class. I'm going to go to like three classes out of the nine I'm teaching. This uh, It's a short nine-week course on 
media careers and uh, did the same thing last semester. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. So I want to jump right in. You grew up in in Fruitland, Idaho. Did you always know you wanted to go to the University of Idaho? And did you always know you wanted to major in journalism? Well, um, in terms of the University of Idaho, it was definitely on my radar to go to college. And I think then as now, mm -hmm. it was the place to go. At least I felt that way, and I still do. Um, Harvard of Idaho, right? You know, and, and it's the it's the school. And so, you know, when I was looking at my list. I, was, I, I knew in high school I wanted to become a journalist. Um, at least I thought I did. I'm not sure what the, I knew what that meant, but I worked for the school paper. I was into sports. I loved to read and write. Sports writing made a lot of sense to me. So that's what I got into. And then shortly after I got to the university, I took a couple classes and uh, found out I really liked it. But when it really clicked was when I went, when I worked for the Argonaut and uh, my sophomore year. And that's when I knew uh, for sure. But uh, no, it's, it's been a great career. Um, I'm not sure, there's not too many people that can say that they spent their whole career in newspapers these days. So I was lucky. Yep, yep, truly, truly. Um, you, were, you were and are a really enthusiastic member of the Fiji fraternity um, and you worked at the Argonaut, you mentioned that. How did those experience uh, your experiences prepare you for the career that you ended up having? Uh, well, the argument was obviously a big, the first time I'd ever been in a newsroom, the first time I had to write a story, let alone write a story on deadline. So that was a real learning experience. Um, and I think Phi Gamma Delta shaped me in ways that I didn't even know for sure until much later. But I mean, it, I was a, basically an only child. I had too much older siblings. And so when I went, I was spoiled. And when I went to college, I had to live with you know 70 other other guys and it was pretty apparent quickly that I didn't get to to eat first I didn't get anything first I had to wait <laughs> with everybody else yeah. and so it was a great experience but it learned to teach you how to, those social skills that you need um, to get along in the world and uh, and I think I think it really shaped me I think there were guys in the house in the Phi Gamma Delta house that believed in me more than I believed in myself and they helped me along the way and and I, I really um, you know, I really am a proud Fiji, obviously a proud um, Argonaut person. And then when you throw the University of Idaho in there, I, I just love the campus, love the school, love it. Who was your favorite faculty member? Uh, probably Burt Cross. Oh, uh, yeah. I had one of those classes and uh, Ted Stanton was, was a good one too. Oh um, I took a class from Jay Shelley, who was the Lewiston Tribune uh, big shot. And he took an investigative journalism course. So those were the mentors I had in college, I think. But there were mentors at the house. Um, I used to look up to all the, the seniors when I was a freshman, hoping that they would not discover that I was, uh, you know, completely unworthy of even been, being at, uh, at a university level and being at the PG house. Uh, but I told myself, if I can be half the guy that those seniors are, I'll be happy with myself. And, uh, you know, by the time I was a junior, I was looking around and those guys were looking at me like that. And I realized it had happened. I'd become half the person the seniors were, and I was fine with that. They were pretty big, people, so I, I enjoyed uh, enjoyed my experience greatly. Did you have a job right out of school, or did it take a while? I did again a lucky break. Uh, I worked at the, the uh, what was then the Idahoan, Idahoan, the Moscow Daily, Pullman Daily News as a as a junior, and then my senior year at the Lewiston Tribune. So I had some mentors there too. Um, Glenn Drosnow, I can mention him for sure. On the sports desk? Yeah, yeah, I worked in sports, answered phones, went out and covered high school games. Occasionally they'd let me cover a college game and do a feature. It was a great experience. And then right out of college, I actually had a couple, three places I could choose between. Nice. And I ended up in Yakima uh, working for a guy that uh, is on this call, Jim Scoggins, who was um, sobbed through the uh, the rough exterior and saw a diamond in the rough and decided to hire me. And then, uh, you know, it was, it was great. He used to say that uh, he was the only um, guy that I could, he could hire and bring to Moscow to widen his horizons because I was from Fruitland. But uh, I think he meant as a compliment. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, as you said, you were lucky you, your whole career in journalists, journalism, four decades. 
talk a little bit about how that world changed in the time that you were working in it, because it did dramatically. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, um, it's mind boggling, really. When you think about what it was like when I started, um, there weren't computers, we didn't have PCs. Uh, we used typewriters and not even electric ones at, at, at Lewiston. Um, you took notes when you called that when you came back from a game, you either had to drive back to the office and file the story or you had to call it in and dictate it over the phone. And it wasn't until, you know, probably two years or a year and a half later that the first PCs came in and, uh, and that changed everything. But there was no cell phones, there was no PCs, there was no email, there was no, there was no web. Um, everything was in the newspaper. And, you know, when I look back at, at all the changes, I think what I realize is um, how, how the newspaper business has changed, but how it still comes down to great storytelling, great journalism. And that's why I'm back at Idaho trying to help teach the, um, the, the next generation of journalists. Yeah, the technology changes alone. Crazy. I was a reporter in a former life and I can remember um, when they switched from manual typewriters to computers at the Tribune, we had to replace all the keyboards because all of us were used to just pounding the hell out of whatever we were working on. And um, we went through a lot of computer uh, keyboards during that time. But yeah, the technology has changed, changed so much. What about the nature of the news, the things that, were that we have been covered? And, and um, I, I think of the advent of 24-hour news stations and what impact that had, has had on how we digest news. Right, well, you know, I'm retired, semi-retired now, and, and so I have a lot more time to watch the news and it just, I just, it's really easy to just sit there and watch it all day long and, you know, switch channels and stuff and look at it. But, you know, I think what passes for news now isn't really news, it's more entertainment than news. And whenever you see three or four talking heads on a panel, you, it's their opinion. And I think um, uh, the newspapers and all the media can do a better job of labeling that stuff. Uh, it's, it's really, it's easy to, and then you end up in your own echo chamber on top of it because there's state, there's networks and, and sources of news that really you agree with. So you tend to go back to them, but no matter what's, what you, what your, um, what your political views are. And when you get in that echo chamber, I think it's really helped um, separate the, and, and make it an even wider contrast between left, right, moderate. You know, I think it's really changed the, the whole conversation. And, and 24 hour news is every, everybody's 24 hour news. Um, the Argonauts 24 hour news. Um, the Seattle Times is, everybody has to be, and it changes how you view the news. But, but one of the things I, I'm really proud of late in my career is that I was an old guy who made the transition <laughs> and actually led, led the Seattle Times um, in, in many ways into becoming a new, uh, digital first newsroom. Um, it was a pretty easy lift because these are some of the smartest people and best journalists you'll ever you'll ever be around. But it was it was a transition we had to make, and but when we came right down to it, we had all this information about our stories that told us who was reading them, when they were reading them, where they were reading them, how long they spent on them, uh, whether they came back and subscribed later, and what it, what it made me realize the the stories that people really cared about and subscribed for were the deep dive feature stories that I always knew were the ones people wanted. And, and they were the, the, the profiles and the really good investigative stories. Those are the ones that, that, that really mean the most. Back in the old days, if I saw somebody reading the paper, the Yakima Herald, when I was um, you know, walking down the street, I was thrilled. They read my story. Now you knew exactly who didn't read it and who did. And that was pretty exciting to know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned earlier the difference between entertainment and news. When you look at the landscape today, how do you distinguish? How, how do I distinguish it? Between the two, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and news. You know, there's, there's cues. And, and one of the things I'm trying to teach in my classes is how to recognize news and, and it's like what sources are those news stories coming from? Um, you know, how well reported is it? Is it a one source story? Is it a no source story? And then um, are they quoting sources that really kind of echo their own opinion. Is it, if it's a conservative source, is it all conservative sources? Or is it, are they really trying to get both sides of the story? 
and, and that goes left and right. So that's one of the things you, it, it's not easy sometimes. They disguise it pretty well, but, um, and, and, you know, I've been in journalism my whole career, so it's got to be a lot harder if you're uh, just a consumer of news. But I just think you have to be really aware and question everything. How does that, um, how do you think that's contributed to what seems to be a growing mistrust of mainstream media now? I'm sure it had something to do with it, but there's a mistrust in everything, all the institutions in America right now. It's not just the media, it's the, it's even the elections and the, and the, and the government itself. Uh, and I'm not saying it's all, everybody uh, mistrusts everything, but there's definitely a, a, a rift. I think some of it is self-inflicted. Uh, I don't think the newspapers and, and, and TV and all the, all the different media label their stuff very well. I think you need to tell people, what is this? Is this a news story? Is this opinion? Is it something different than that? And who wrote it? And who is that person that wrote it? All those things are possible now with the newspaper uh, websites and all those things. You can click on a story and find all that information. You got you to be really transparent. I don't think we've been transparent enough. But then you end up with a president who, you know, frankly, you know, said that it was all fake news and didn't believe anything. And a lot of people just bought, bought that argument. And so we've got a lot of work to do. The media has a lot of work to do. The country has a lot of work to do to uh, kind of believe in themselves, get and heal those wounds. I was going to ask you what your response to that mantra is about fake news. Well, there's definitely fake news. I mean, another thing to think about, I think there's always mistakes in stories. And, and if there's a, a small error, people look at it and go, aha, fake news. Well, people make mistakes. It doesn't mean the, the entire story is, is wrong. But I think there's so many sources of news now. Anybody can, can be a, a reporter. I mean, if they, they can put their own blog up and there's a lot of shaky uh, websites and, and sources. So there is fake news and um, some of it's out there and you just gotta, you gotta really understand where you're getting your news and, and make sure you know it's not Facebook you're getting your news from. It's not Google you're getting your news from, it's not Twitter. They're, they're um, giving you those, the news stories, but um, they're feeding it to you. That's, that's how they're given to you. But who's writing them? Is it the Washington Post? Is it the New York Times? Is it Fox? Who is it? You know, that's, that's what we have to be discerning about those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just being able to put those filters in place, I think, is, uh, is an interesting process. And the ones you ticked off, a lot of times there are no filters. It's like whatever anyone wants to put up, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of new, newspapers find themselves cutting staffs and reducing the number of uh, issues they have in a week. How is the business model for newspapers and uh, newspapers in particular, but media in general, um, how sustainable are those? And what's, what's next when those business models um, aren't sustainable? Well, there's definitely the, the news, uh, newspapers are definitely in danger and not, not the New York Times or the Washington Post. Wall Street Journal, those, those newspapers are, are doing okay because they have a bigger footprint and they can draw from international news. But uh, uh, newspapers are definitely struggling. And I think uh, part of it is, again, self-inflicted. I, I think um, back when I was in newspapers in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, we made, newspapers made a huge amount of money and it was, it was a cash cow. You had three sources of revenue. You had subscription revenue, you had advertising revenue. And you had classified advertising revenue. And those and classified was a third of our revenue. And um, I still say our, even though I'm not a newspaper guy anymore, but I can't help it. But that classified just dried up. It's gone. And and now print advertising revenue is is you know 60, 70% down what it was at the in its heyday. So when you lose one and a half legs off that three-legged stool, it's gonna be really, really difficult to make ends meet. And newspapers didn't recognize that soon enough. I think the other thing that newspapers did and all, all media has done is they didn't recognize that you have to make people pay for the news. We, we thought that enough eyeballs on a story, enough advertising, um, online revenue would come in to support the, the, the newsroom and it didn't work. Uh, so now they've gone to a subscription model, the Seattle Times did, and I know all, pretty much all newspapers have. And but it took a while because people don't want to pay for something that was free for 10 years. So it's taken us this long to convince people um, that it's worth paying for. 
But the fact is, if you don't have those news sources anymore, if it's gone, who's going to, in Yakima, who's going to uh, hold the city council accountable and the county council? And, um, and, and, and the same goes for every community where we live in. The newsrooms are, are much smaller. Part of it is due to um, um, big corporations, you know, taking over newsrooms and just selling them off and bleeding them dry. Um, I think we're, we're definitely lucky in Lewiston and Moscow because, because and Spokane and Yakima and Walla Walla, Seattle, they have uh, family ownership, local ownership that, that still believes in it, but that's not true in a lot of places. Right. So I could talk for an hour on that subject alone, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, I want to elaborate, want you to elaborate a little bit though. Will we reach a point where a, a print version, now I read my newspaper, I read two or three every morning. I do the jumble, I do the crossword. Is that gonna go away? I mean, in your opinion, eventually? Uh, I can see a day, I don't know when it's gonna happen, if it's gonna be 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, when there will not be a daily newspaper in most cities. Um, I think there'll always be a Sunday paper and there's a place for that, mm -hmm. I hope. And there'll definitely be, um, you know, delivering news to you through your phone and your, and your computer. But I think it'll be a website and a, and, a, and a Sunday paper. I hope it doesn't happen before I'm off the face of the earth because I really enjoy, enjoy <laughs> the, the jumble and reading the paper and, and, and all that too. And it's not just because I'm a newspaper guy, it's a habit you, you just get used to. And I think, uh, I feel sorry for the next generation that gets its news in other ways. And, and, and uh, you know, they probably look at me like a dinosaur, but I'm proud of, uh, of newspapers. I hope they're around for a while. But I can definitely see a day when um, when there won't be a printed newspaper on your doorstep, and you'll be telling your kids or grandkids, "Yeah, that was in the paper," and they'll say, "What paper? What was that?" And you'll <laughs> tell them that you got delivered on your doorstep every morning, and they'll say, "What? Yeah. What? Are you kidding me?" And I, you know, I swear I did, and uh, nobody will believe you. Wow, it's wow. pretty to think about. I want to ask about. Um how the role of the reporter has changed in the time you were in the business. Because I can remember, you know, it was a notebook, a pen, a typewriter, you know, two or three stories a day, whatever. And now I know reporters have to do, produce so much more because, or, um, because of the difference in the product. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely a harder job than it used to be. Um, and you have, to, you have to find people that are really, really good at juggling a lot of balls. Um, you know, doing the quick turn stories that you have to get out there quickly and, and, the, and the features that are two or three days out and then the big stories. Those are the, the journalists that they're just, they're amazing people. And I don't think people realize how hard a job that is. Um, and yet it all comes down to good storytelling. I'll, I'll say that over and over again. If you can, I tell my students that, if you can tell a good story, and I mean a true story, not making stuff up. That's a whole other thing. But tell a, a good story that's that's really accurate, but is is really tells a story that's worth telling. And and um, and if you have you have that, and you have editors that make stories better, you will always have a place for those people. Uh, journalists are will always have a job. It's just the medium that's changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, you were mentioned your teaching courses and, and uh, you're still involved with the fraternity. We had a great reunion, Fiji reunion last, was it last year or last spring? I can't even it remember. It seemed like 10 years ago because but yeah. March, March, March 7th, we had 500 people show up for a, an event. It was probably the last thing any of us went to. And uh, that was, it seems like it didn't even happen because it was so surreal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My question for that is, why is it important for you to give back? You're giving back in a lot of different ways to the university. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm making up for lost time, honestly. I, I got disconnected from Idaho and from the fraternity. Um, I got busy with my career, raising kids. Um, you know, everybody gets busy. And I was in Seattle. It's five and a half hours, five hours away. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I came back for a reunion in 2006, my 30th class reunion for my fraternity. And it was just, it was, it just blew my mind how much I missed those guys, uh, how much I missed the house, how much I missed the campus. And I have not failed to make our dinner, our annual dinner since. And every time I went back, I tried to talk to the journalism department. Uh, my old classmate, um, Kenton Bird, um, would always have me in for a class and we'd always talk and have lunch. And, uh, and then when I retired, 
I thought back what I really loved to do the most. And uh, what I loved to do the most was to teach young writers and help them get better. And so I had an opportunity to kind of reinvent myself and mm -hmm. my second, third, I don't know what chapter it is, but it's a, it's not the first chapter. Hopefully it's not the last chapter, but it's a fun chapter. I really enjoy it. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you said nine week course this year, um, this semester, right on how to get a job in journalism. How to get a job in the media. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's fun. And those kids are as scared as I was when I graduated. So nothing's changed there. Um, they're great kids and I'm helping them. We do resumes and cover letters and networking, all the soft skills of, of being interviewed on Zoom and in person and all that stuff. I did a feature writing course last semester and that was fantastic too. So it's been a, a, just a, a wonderful experience. I had a chance to read some of the uh, projects from some of the journalist, uh, journalism students last semester. It gives me hope for the profession. There are some really good, good writers out there. It's yeah, I got to give a shout out to my all, all the journalism students I've had here at Idaho. They are sharp and uh, I, it does, it gives you um, hope for the future. I, I knew they were smart, but they are way smarter than I was when I was their age. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Great. I know we've got some questions, Christy, so I'm going to turn it over to you and we'll try to field as many as we possibly can in the time we have uh, left. Christy? Okay. Um, this is a follow-up to the print media conversation that you just had about how long print uh, media will last. And they ask, are there any strategies that print news could adopt to survive as long as possible? Yeah, well, that was, uh, that was what I was working on right up to the day I, I retired. Um, I think there's a lot of things you can do. There's, um, I mean, first of all, you really have to make your content not just superficial. You have to make it give them the meaty stories that they want. You have to cover the fun stories too, you know, the fun little um, talker stories that uh, over breakfast, you're gonna say, hey, look at this story. But the, those deeper dive ones are the ones people pay for. I think you have to get on social media as much as, as hard as that is for everybody. You have to get your stories, stories out there on Facebook. And, and I think um, you, have to, uh, you have to give journalists the time to do good stories too. I think there's a, a a tendency for editors, and I'm sure I was guilty of this, of, um, of rushing everything. You know, you have to get it first and you have to get it fast. And, and sometimes you get it wrong if you do that. And I think you have to really, that credibility that newspapers have is not something to, to take lightly. It's something that we have that um, the blogger down the street doesn't have. And, uh, and we have to protect that at all costs. Yeah. There's a lot of other stuff we can do too, like newsletters, uh, email newsletters, but I know the University of Idaho does, are really good ways of getting curated news out to people. Um, I get the New York Times newsletter, the Seattle Times one. Uh, I think those are good. And smaller papers don't have the resources to do that, but they need to find a way to get it done. Okay, so someone wants to know what you think of the, the 208 on KTVB. Apparently it's the news at five o'clock. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. Haven't seen it. I wish I could tell you it's wonderful. I'm sure it is, but I don't, <laughs> haven't watched it. I'm going to have to, when I go to Moscow, I'm going to have to check it out. It's called the 208. It's called the 208 apparently. And it, they suggested that it's more like a conversation rather than the news. Maybe, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, Sam, watch the 208. I mean, those are good. I mean, I think, uh, I think you have to be, that's the other thing you have to, reporters can't just be this, this um, person behind a desk, you, know, you don't know who they are. The, the great thing about social media and um, the web is that you get a lot more feedback on your story. Some of it's not good, some of it's pretty ugly, but, but some of it's good. And you know, back in the day when I was a reporter, you, you'd get back from vacation, you'd have like two snail mail letters and one voicemail, and that was it. Now you get hundreds of emails every day. So it's really easy to keep that conversation going and important to do that. Okay, so how can we hold media responsible for accurate re uh, accurate reporting? With your pocketbook. I mean, if they make a mis if you don't like what they're reporting, you just don't subscribe, and that's what it comes down to. Um, I think accuracy is um, a little bit subjective. It shouldn't be, but it is. It's objective. I mean, that's what accuracy is. Objective. What are the facts? The facts can change. 
But one of the best, one of the facts that we have right now, the best set of facts we have to write this story. Um, unfortunately, if you're on one side of the aisle, you may think that um, the story is inaccurate. And on the other side, you may think it's accurate. Uh, I think you have to separate those two things. When I was sports editors, I used to say uh, it was a good week when I got a complaint from a Husky and a complaint from a Cougar over the same story because it meant we were right where we should be. We're, we're making everybody mad and we're making them think. And I think the same is true in the political forum. If I got a, uh, you know, five calls from Republicans and conservatives complaining that we were too liberal and then got as many calls complaining that we were too hard on Donald Trump, then I figured, okay, we're, uh, we're doing okay there. We're, we're probably holding people accountable. And I think people forget that the newspapers, uh, that any journalist's number one job is to hold people accountable, to give voice to the voiceless, to hold people accountable for their actions. And that includes Jeff Bezos and Donald Trump and, and Jay Inslee and everybody, you know? That's what we do. We should make them a little uncomfortable sometimes. Absolutely. Um, other than newspaper writing, what other types of items have you written? Have you written any magazine articles, books, that sort of thing? Yes, on the magazine articles, mostly newspapers. Uh, I always loved feature writing and people stories. Uh, I used to tell all my reporters when I was sports editor and editor, you're not writing a, well, in sports, you're not writing a game story. You're writing a story about a person or people. And you're, you're writing a feature about the game. And so I, I always um, told that, I always held that. Uh, and so the features were always my favorites. Um, and that's, why I that's probably why I enjoyed the feature writing course so much. But um, in terms of books, I'm writing one right now. Um, it's uh, not as easy as it looks. It's, uh, it's hard. I thought it was going to be easy, but it's really hard. I've done over 100 interviews, and I yeah. don't even have no idea how many hundreds of hours I've spent in the, in the library and, and virtually trying to research it. It's a book about the fraternity chapter I'm in. It's not going to be a bestseller, I can tell you that, but Fiji's will love it, I think. <laughs> the Fiji's will. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, as you continue to um, expand on some topics, we get more and more questions. So how did competition in the news space impact you being a journalist? A competing newspaper in Seattle, television stations, adding websites, that sort of thing. How yeah. did that competition? That, I want to make sure I understand. Are you saying that how did it feel to be attacked by? I, I think it says, how did competition in the news space impact you in oh. being a journalist? So. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Uh, I think you just had more competition. You When I was, when I first came to the Seattle Times, it was the Seattle Times, the Seattle PI, two newspapers going head to head and maybe some suburban papers. But then later we were on the web and so were the TV stations. We were doing video, so were the TV stations. We were doing audio, so were the radio stations. So you end up with everybody doing everything and not necessarily real well sometimes, but you're competing for every, every, um, every nickel and every reader. And uh, that's, a, you know, that's a hard job. You gotta do it well. And uh, if you don't do well, they just don't read you. The Seattle Times, when I first started there, had a circulation of probably 200 and 20,000 people daily and over 500,000 um, on Sunday. And now that circulation is probably more like 100,000 daily and maybe 220,000 um, on Sunday. But they have 73,000 digital only subscribers and they get, they, and they have, um, I'm sure it's, it's over a million readers every week that read the, read the news from the Seattle Times. So no one's ever read more of your work if you're a newspaper journalist. It's true. I mean, it, it doesn't seem that way, but it's true. They just aren't necessarily all paying for it. And, uh, and it's a struggle, but um, they are reading it. It's getting out there. Did I answer the question? I'm not sure if I did, but <laughs> the sign of a good uh, journalist, you don't answer the question. You ask them, but you don't answer them. <laughs> you just kind of evade the question. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. How difficult was the transition from sports, where you spent the majority of your career, to becoming the editor in chief of the Seattle Times? Well, that was a hard one. That, that was a tough transition, I got to tell you. Um, I loved sports editor, was my dream job. When I graduated from college, 
and Jim Scoggins, who's on this on this Zoom thing, asked me what my goal was. I, I kind of yammered and didn't have an answer. And he said, you got to have a goal. And I blurted out that I wanted to be the sports editor of the Seattle Times, which I had no business uh, thinking I'd ever do, but I did it. And then they made me the executive editor. So I just treated it like um, it's you're a journalist. You're telling stories. And I felt the newsroom at that point needed, um, well, we needed to become more digital. And sports had already done that. And so that was part of my job. But also just trust people and let, I wasn't, I had 160 people in the newsroom and I wasn't trying to manage all of them. I had really good people that managed them and I just made sure they had the right tools. And I tried to get around and, and talk to people mm -hmm. and, and make them feel good about themselves. Because at that point, people were beating up on newspapers and not all the journalists felt good about, you know, there were layoffs. One of the early things I had to do was lay off some people. So I was really, uh, a, I'm a big booster. I'm a, a very optimistic person. And so part of my job was to make people realize what an honor it was to do what they do, do and how well they did it. So, you know, I guess in some ways it was not my dream job. It was a hard job, but I, I love doing it. I'm glad I did it. Okay, can you con comment on the recent major lawsuits against journalists and will this be a growing thing? Will it help reduce some challenges in this area? Um, you're probably talking about the, uh, the, the company that the, the uh, company with the software that voting happened to the, the yeah, uh, I think that's what you're talking about. Can you comment on the major lawsuits against journalists that have spread and support? Yeah, yeah. no, I think again, journalists have some protections. Uh, I'm not a libel expert. Um, uh, we have a lot smarter people that do that, but I think again, it's holding people accountable for what they do. But I think there does have to, there is a first amendment protection um, for journalists and, and it's an important one. And you have to, you have to, you know, it has to be pretty, pretty out there for them, uh, for them to be held uh, in a suit. The other thing is that anybody can sue anybody. So you have to remember that. It doesn't necessarily mean that they did something wrong. And, uh, you know, the Seattle Times got sued a couple of times while I was there. And it's not a fun thing, but you, you fight for what's right. And you, if you're doing your job well, you should be able to, you know, you should be able to, to feel comfortable doing it. Okay, how can, I like this one. Um, how can Idaho recruit strong faculty in communications when they have to compete with the likes of U of Dub, WSU, Oregon, and some private institutions who all have a greater financial capacity to recruit and retain faculty? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I think, I think Idaho is a special place. I'll, I'll say that. Um, and maybe if you didn't go to school there, you don't understand it. But if you've ever spent any time in Moscow and walking through campus, it's, it's an amazing place. Uh, it's, it's this kind of idyllic corner of the world where some of the problems have not, uh, have not hatched. And so when I go there, it's just so different from Seattle. But it's also isolated. And I think that's a little bit of a problem. I know that's why I got disconnected. So I think the university needs to keep, keep doing a good job of connecting the graduates together. I, I, think, that, I think you're doing a great job, Kathy, and your team. I've, I've, some of the stuff you're doing is just great. And just keep up the good work. And hopefully, you'll be able to recruit people, uh, people like, well, Bruce Pittman, Kent Bird. I mean, they're, they're just top-notch people. And they come back, and they give back. And I'm, you know. I'm not a, a great teacher by any means, but I'm learning every day and I love doing it. So I'm trying to give back to, and I think that's one piece of advice I'd give to anybody that's a graduate is to consider coming back. And even if you can't teach, you can give back somehow, um, yeah. whether it's money or time or there's a mentorship program you can sign up for. Those are all really good things. And um, I think Idaho is just a special place. I love that. I love that university. Yep, it is a special place for sure. Um, when the president when the president can instantly communicate with 80 million followers and then they in turn can communicate to millions more shouldn't that be good isn't firsthand communication the best where does journalism fit in that yeah it, def it definitely is it should be good um un unfortunately there is some misinformation that can get out and that's something that that the media is struggling with right now uh, twitter facebook all the all the mediums We've seen that. Um, and who decides what's accurate, what's not accurate? 
What, one thing that I think is really good that I've seen lately is, and, and you feel free to disagree if you, if you don't agree with this, but I think telling people when something's not factual, when, they, when it's a proven that it's, it's inaccurate, to be, to be able to say that. And I think there was a time when, uh, you know, not too long ago when we were afraid to say it. And I think when, when people uh, don't tell the truth, and I'm not just talking about a certain president, I'm talking about anybody, you should hold them accountable and say, this is what they said, this is what actually happened, and, and you can, you can, it's okay to do that. Um, it's a tough situation. I think Twitter and social media has contributed to the division in the country, no doubt. Mm -hmm. How do you heal that? I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't, yeah. I think this one kind of is a follow up to that. And it says, in this environment of echo chambers, how does the media overcome any perceived bias and reclaim the reputation of honest news? You know, well, using social yeah. media platforms and things that all that stuff that's out there, how do they reclaim, reclaim re their reputation? Well, it's really hard. I mean, you just have to keep, um, you keep, keep doing it. Keep talking to your reporters, keep talking to your editors. Um, don't compromise those that, that credibility that I talked about. Um, the thing is, credibility is a, a great thing. You can build it for, you know, you can have a hundred stories that are completely accurate and they're, and they're great. And then one big mistake can, can hurt your credibility and then people don't believe you anymore. So you gotta really be careful about that. And I think it's, you have to be more transparent about when you're wrong and how it happened. I think um, when I was editor, I tried to write some stuff about what happened behind the scenes when, uh, when things did go wrong. And I think readers do appreciate that. You're human, you make mistakes. Um, they want, I think there was, for a long time, there was this kind of curtain that you didn't go behind. You didn't get a look in the newsroom and see what was actually happening. I think we need to uh, pull that back a little bit more and, and allow people to see it. Okay, this is another great one. How can we save local news on a national or global le level? It's um, they say wiki news for community question mark no it's not newsprint but local media is in critical condition it is in critical condition not everywhere but most places uh, the first thing you can do is, is, is subscribe and and that means um you know paying for what you're reading and that's you know even if you're if you're uh, in the zoom call and you're not from moscow or lewiston or or wherever and you want to read local news from this area subscribe to it you can do it fairly cheaply um, and I think pay, pay for several news sources. Um, people go on Facebook and, and go, to, um, go on Twitter and they get their news for free doing it that way. But if you really like what you read, you gotta, you gotta pay for it. Um, and I think um, newspapers have um, levers and mechanisms they can use to kind of close that hole in their, in their uh, readership where people can get in for free. It's not foolproof, but um, we used to give it away free and then it went down and you could have 20 stories before you had to pay for it. And now I think the Seattle Times is at three stories. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true probably in Moscow and Lewiston as well. So um, you know, make sure you pay for it. I think also a big, big, big problem is Google and Facebook. They are, uh, you know, they're, they're sucking the, and the big corporations are sucking uh, uh, the money out of they get all the advertising dollars, so the newspapers and, and other places don't get it. And then hedge funds buy the newspapers, sell the property, and, uh, and lay off the whole staff, and then they wonder why the newspaper's failing. Yeah. But we're lucky because Moscow and Lewiston, even though it's a struggle and, and they're not, their newsrooms aren't as big as they used to be, um, they're still fairly, they're still hanging in there. Well, you sure certainly have changed my view on uh, paying for paying for content. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's good. That's one. You know, one of the things one of the things I'm kind of proud of is our the journalism class I taught last semester. Uh, Kent and I um, they had to, they had some problems, uh, some financial issues at the Moscow Lewiston papers that are owned by the Albert family, which is an amazing legacy. And so we offered to give them, uh, not give them offer our stories from our class from that we produced last semester. And so we've, every Saturday, their slice of life features one of our students' stories. And um, I think we've run four so far and they're really good stories. And um, the students are thrilled because they get published and it goes you know, in their clip file. And the, and the newspaper's thrilled because they get content 
and uh, it's good for everybody. It's a win-win. I just want to note that uh, Butch Alford, former uh, State Board of uh, Education member and publisher of the Lewiston Tribune, is joining us today. Uh, he was my boss for a while. I worked in Lewiston, so hi, yeah, Butch. Me too. Me too. He was great. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Butch. He's one of the heroes in this business. Oh, that's great. So someone wants to know which news outlets or organizations do you have the most confidence in the veracity and accuracy of their reporting? Wow, okay. Well, it's hard to beat the New York Times. Um, they're, they're incredible. Uh, they've got, I think, close to 2000 journalists in their newsroom now worldwide. I mean, their stories are incredible when you read them. I think the Washington Post is pretty darn good too. I think the Wall Street Journal is pretty good. Uh, but locally, you know, I think there's some regional newspapers like the Seattle Times that do a really good job. And I would not, uh, I would not, I would not discount the local, local news. I mean, I, I read the Lewiston and Moscow papers and I see some really good journalism. I think the Spokesman Review does a good job too. And, uh, and also you need to be able to separate the opinion section page from the news. And that's another thing that I think a uh, newspaper should do a better job of separating that out, making people understand that just because um, the Seattle Times took a certain stance on its editorial page and opinion page, doesn't mean that we can't still cover the news. There's a big wall at most newspapers and you do not know what the opinion section's gonna write and you don't have any impact on it and they don't have any impact on what you're writing. Those, those two things should be separated and they are usually. How about broadcast, Don? Um, I think the, the major networks do, it, do still do a pretty good job. I tend to watch NBC probably, um, but I think they're all pretty good. Um, I, I don't want to get into a political thing because you go too much farther than that. I do watch CNN, um, but I think you got to know when you're watching a commentator and when you're not watching the news. Um, and it seems like each side gets drawn into this, like, you know, this, this gun battle where they take a shot at the other side and then the other side has to take a shot at the, the other one. And it's just a waste of energy and resources, I think. And I, it just, it makes me mad when I see either side do it. So I, I don't like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that it's hard to beat the New York Times when you're looking at a, nat, a big major, um, they're, they're really good. Not perfect, but they're pretty good. That's great. Okay, I think this is our final question. Kathy, is this, are we almost out of time or? Well, I'm having a good time, so <laughs> <laughs> it went fast. I don't know if it did for you guys, but I had a good time. It does, it always goes by too fast. Yeah. Um, this one says, while um, it seems that there is almost no diversity in thought as almost all media supports the progressive and anti-constitutional perspective. Um, you can address whether you agree with that or not. Uh, were people ever fired because you had too many writers with the same viewpoint? Huh. Well, I'd say no to the last question. I don't think I ever fired anybody because they had the same viewpoint as someone else. Um, I mean, you, you, hire, you, you hire writers not for their viewpoints, but because of their objectivity, that they are good reporters and they are able to separate uh, their own personal biases, which we all have, and just report the story. And then you have a layer of editors that make sure they do that. And then you have another layer of editors that make sure that nothing slips through. So when I was the executive editor in sports, I, I looked at it that way. I once hired a Oregon Duck, a University of Oregon graduate to cover the Huskies. And oh my God, they were so mad at me. They thought, how could you do that? Well, the same way, you know, you shouldn't, be able to tell if a writer's a Democrat or Republican or, or an independent. You should, that shouldn't be, um, no matter what they're covering, you shouldn't be able to tell that. Um, does it seep into the newsroom sometimes? Probably. But I remember uh, my first election night as executive editor when Donald Trump was elected president. And I remember we pulled everybody aside and said, at the very start of the night, and said, no matter what happens, you have to be objective. You can't be cheering. You can't be crying. You can't be high-fiving. There's a, in, in sports, the same thing happens. You say, no cheering in the press box. When no matter who's winning or losing, a reporter's got to be right there and looking at it. Or does that mean every reporter in America is perfect and, and never uh, 
never shows his bias, her bias, their bias. No, they, it happens. And, and our most general, is, is there the tendency to be a little bit left leaning in the media? Probably. But, um, you know, we got to be really careful that we don't let that influence the news coverage. And that's, you know, what I tried to do my whole career and hopefully did. And I, I think you'd be surprised at how many conversations there are in newsrooms about what you're talking about, about not having bias. And uh, when you're a journalist for 10 years, let alone 40 years, you can sniff out BS pretty easily. I mean, when you see a story come through and it's like, okay, that doesn't make sense. They haven't talked to the right people. They haven't come to the right conclusions. Uh, you can see it and most editors will throw it back and, and make them do it over again or kill the story completely. And we need to keep doing that. We don't wanna lose the credibility of the, of the public. Yeah. Here's one last quick one. Okay. What, what books do you enjoy reading? Hmm. Uh, I, read, I don't read a lot of fiction. I, I, I think the world is so crazy right now that you don't need to read nonfiction. You can just, <laughs> I mean, nonfiction is the way to go because it's crazier right now than I've ever seen it. Um, I think it's gonna calm down a little bit, but when you look at what this world has gone through for the last year, and we've had a pandemic, we've had a recession, depression, whatever you want to call it, the bottom fall out of the economy. We've had, we had, we've had um, the craziest political season of, of all time, basically an insurrection on, in the, in, on the US Capitol. You can't make stuff like that up. There's never been a time when we needed journalists more than we need them now. When you were looking at those pictures, although some of them were taken by body cams and, 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 and by some of the, the rioters, but you saw journalists out there, you know, risking life and limb to give you the news. And that's a big deal. I, I think, I hope you appreciate that. Uh, I know I do. Okay. Kathy, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. And I will unmute because I've been on Zoom for a year and I know how to do that. Um, <laughs> um, uh, we're gonna let Don have one last word, but before we do that, we're gonna announce our uh, a raffle winner is um, Mercedes Frosto is uh, going to get that Vandal gift card from Payne West. I want to thank I want to thank everyone. Yay! Yay. I want to thank everyone for again for coming. And Don, any closing words? That last that last bit there was pretty darn was pretty darn motivating. I'm just looking at going through the the list of people and recognize a lot of cool names. So I I told everybody that I was going to give out a shout out to Fruitland because that's where I'm from. And I've done that, I did it a second time, Fiji as well. Um, but University of Idaho is, like I said earlier, a special place. I would just say, um, give back, try to give back. Even if it's just going back there for a weekend and, and, and talking to one student, just do what you can because those students really need it. And uh, we're, the university is going through a real big transition right now with an incredible leader, I think, as president and a lot of good things happening but they need the alumni to, to pitch in monetarily with their time and effort. And uh, I think you'll never regret it. I, I, I'm having just an incredibly good time teaching at the U and I can't wait to go back next week. And when I walk down Hello Walk from the Fiji house to the administration building, I feel like I'm 20 years old again. And then I look in the mirror and realize, well, that isn't the case anymore, but I still love coming back. Great, thank you. What a great message. Again, thank you all. Uh, appreciate uh, your attendance. I appreciate your uh, um, participating with us today and uh, have a great evening. And as always, go Vandals. Thank you very much. <laughs>